The first way, the first of the three things, here we go. The first is what I call being shamed directly by toxic parents, which is what I call weaponized shame to get kids to be compliant. This is like the finger in your face kind of stuff that really makes a child feel awful and that's actually the goal. If you've heard stuff like, why can't you be like so and so? How could you do that? How could you do this to me? Don't you know any better? What were you thinking? Notice those are all rhetorical questions to put a child on the spot and make them feel awful. It's like a shame bazooka aimed at the goal of getting them to be compliant. Here's an Instagram post of mine from a long time ago when I was thinking about this, some examples of, on the left side we have an example of toxic parenting. Make children compliant. Shame is the tool that the parent's emotions are the priority, not the child. And the goal is to reduce the parental stress in life. In healthy parenting, the goal is to make children safe or the, 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 the way we do it. Love is the tool versus shame. And the child's growth is the priority to increase the child's resiliency in life. We don't wanna shame our kids that they won't even sort of, you know, like have the gumption to go try out for something or or to put the application in to get into the, to the program or whatever, is that's what I mean about the effects of shame in, in, in healthy parenting. Directly shaming a child which is unfair and toxic is designed to learn them, to get them to be compliant and not, versus to get them to understand what happened there, which would be what healthy parenting is. So you guys might relate to this. When I was 15 years old, when I was a boy, I, <laughs> that's my Simpsons impression, um, I worked at a pizza shop on weekends. I worked at a couple of them. I worked at like a nursing home kitchen doing things like prep work, you know, like prepping sort of like, a, um, if you're if you're a vegetarian or vegan, uh, this trigger warning on this stuff, um, you know, like putting sort of like roast beef in a bag and weighing that on a scale and like, you know, like cleaning pizza trays from the dough and stuff like that. And um, I was working a meat slicer, probably when I sort of shouldn't have, and I cut a nickel sized chunk out of my thumb, I still have the scar. Um, that and it was like a it was like a big cut it was like lots of instantaneous sort of like gross blood and stuff and the pizza shop was about a mile from where my mother was working and she had to come pick me up to take me to the to the hospital to have it checked out which was only like a couple miles away in the town that I was living in at the time and my mother was irate with me that she had to pause work and do all that there was no concern for my thumb there was no concern for the sort of the freak out about it. It was just like, it was like a nasty, nasty cut. And she was beside herself with the, um, the intrusion in, in sort of in her day. So my mother's main objective there was to make me feel bad about making mistakes that were inconvenient to her. Like I was not supposed to cut my thumb. <laughs> and maybe she was hung over, maybe she was already in trouble at work, doesn't matter, but I think that that might be part of the story too, but the direct shaming was being disgusted with me about making that mistake. And that's the kind of stuff that happens in the day-to-day -day in these families. That's how it was in my family. And it's not just like a singular event. What's heartbreaking about the direct shaming piece related to this is, I mean, I'm giving you a minor example about this stuff, even though that that stayed with me. And incidentally, like, Throughout that whole thing, I just felt like a lousy kid. I just felt stupid. It wasn't just like, oh, you know what I mean? Are you are you okay? Is your thumb okay? And you know, I think the people at work might have thought it was like a little bit sort of humorous and stuff. But I, I just you just end up feeling terrible about it. But what's heartbreaking about the direct shaming piece, a more extreme example, is when children are abused sexually, either outside the home or inside the home, and then they're shamed for it, like they created it and somehow that they're responsible for what the perpetrator did whether it was an adult or another kid, same thing, cold-hearted compliance versus being available and to be an advocate for your child. And what I mean by cold-hearted compliance is just like, oh, I can't handle this, that I can't believe you would do that, that you would go to that place and blah, 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 what does this mean for me? That's what I mean about that stuff. So if you guys wanna get some pen and paper out, I have some homework to do about this first one. The homework on direct shaming, here are some written exercises. These are all written exercises for the homework of these. So number one, and I have three sort of journaling topics here to, to look at this and when it comes to direct shaming. The first is, is to reflect on how this came up for you. Three to four specific situations where you were blamed and shamed unfairly. Remember that kids need help and guidance from like 
the, you know, like from infancy till about 20 to 21, what is the truth about those situations? Did your parents not want to be bothered? Were you self-consumed with their own shame and didn't show up for you? That's what I mean about the pizza story. Like, what is the truth about that is I just made a mistake. It's just part of normal sort of parenting. And there should be there should have been more concern or get your life more together where you're not so embarrassed that you just have to be a parent. So that's the first journaling item. The second one is to write out how one of your situations would have gone down with a healthy parent. If you think about the one that has the most emotional impact about these situations where you're directly shamed, what would that situation have been like with a healthy parent? Like you got bullied at school and you were just sort of blamed and shamed for it. What would a healthy parent have done in that situation? And number three, the, the last journaling topic on this one is, how does being directly shamed in childhood affect your shame beliefs and reactions now? Like you have to be perfect. Or if something goes wrong, like if I hadn't done any of my therapy work, I just would have always thought that I had upset the apple cart in some way because I was just sort of a goofy, terrible person. So that's what I mean by that. The second way shame manifests is indirect shaming. It's like the opposite of the one that we just talked about. Or what I call, this is shame by proxy. Um, by indirect and proxy mean kids are like sponges and we absorb qualities from our parents. Um, or we're highly aware of those qualities. We also have to live with these highly dysfunctional people during the most of our formative years of our life. Here are some examples of what I mean by shame by proxy, and you'll see what I mean. Having parents who exhibit off behaviors, things like alcoholism, they're over the top people pleasing. Um, and this is, an, I, didn't, I didn't have this on my note here, but I just thought about it, is having that parent who is so over the moon about the neighbors and the neighbors kids that's another example of like shame by proxy a because it's off behavior and b because they're sort of the shame of them not being sort of interested in you so another thing is having a parent who's highly codependent that's sort of by proxy that can be shaming a parent who have mental health issues like high reactivity rage hoarding having a sociopathic parent we're, we're usually busy being sort of trying to protect ourselves from them, but the shame of having someone who's that off as a parent. Um, and also we're highly aware that our friend's parents are not like that parent. Parents who phone life in, um, by proxy, we absorb that shame or we get slimed by it, as my mentor would say. Parents who are unwilling to get out of poverty, I know that that's super loaded for many of you and what I mean by it, Think about it mostly about their stuckness as opposed to what society does in terms of poverty. I'm not trying to make it to be like an issue about sort of capitalism or socioeconomic or racism or anything sort of like that. But think about your parents' ability to do better for themselves or do better for their children. That's what I mean by that. We can become shamed in that. Parents who don't know how to end a conversation. Does anybody have uh, a nervous talker or someone who just talks at people rather than, you know, you're, you're eight years old and you're watching this and, you, you know, mom can't stop a conversation because of her anxiety at the grocery store. Parents with poor hygiene. That's a big one. Parents who have a lot of stuff going on. Can you imagine sort of the shame? Parent-teacher conferences drops off and stuff like that with, with our parents not valuing who they are. Um, parents who are inauthentic. Parents who want to be popular and overstep with your friends or the friends of your parents or your par your friends' parents, and they are they're, they they want more of a connection with them. I know that that sounds bizarre, but it does happen. Um, and then the shame for you about not wanting to have friends over because either the, the quality of the house or hoarding or something like that or the rage or how people are. Here's what I'm not describing, and I really want you to take this in, is this is not the same thing as being a moody teen and you hate about being dropped off uh, at the mall by because your mom drives a tan caravan that looks like crap. It's not, it's not that kind of like, oh my God, my parents. This is not that kind of stuff that I'm talking about, so please don't confuse the two things. So this is an awareness that you might be more drawn to if you had a friend that their family was more safe 
that's probably the reason why, if you think about the shame, and there's even sort of shame in that about wanting to be at that house because there's like more sanity or there's more sort of stability or more food or just simply the mom's nicer. So that's what I mean by that. Um, why is this relevant? We carry who our parents were inside of us. Children are an extension of their parents. It can feel like we're an accomplice to their dysfunction growing up. So focus on that word accomplice because that's kind of like what it feels like. Think about your last name growing up and what does it mean? How did you feel about it? What did that name represent? Is there shame there? This concept is trickier because it can be more uh, subconscious, the, the, the shame by proxy. Here's a scene. You're at a restaurant with your parent and the parent is either drunk or tries to make a pa pass at the waiter or waitress, or is excessively cheap, or has really poor social skills, or makes a scene at the host stand, or simply doesn't engage with you from a place of being disinterested or just being immature. That's what I mean about shame by proxy. You're there with that parent. They're supposed to be guiding you through the world and think about the way that they are or think about the way that they behave. So some homework on this one. Uh, three exercises, just like the last one. And number one is very similar to the other one, is to reflect on how shame by proxy came up for you. Three or four specific dynamics or situations where you wanted to crawl into the woodwork or you had to cover up who your parents were. Um, like having the house being a chaotic disaster and not having friends over due to the shame of that. So that's the first one, three to four specific memories or issues or ideas, even if you, I know many of you sort of struggle with remembering, so just try to do your best on that one. Number two out of these three, these three exercises is write out the one, the biggest one of your of your proxy shame sort of stuff if you have them and write, rewrite it, well, what would it be like with a healthy parent? This is actually tricky because it might feel obvious or a little bit even pedantic is to not have a parent try to steal my friends, to have a parent who had their life together and wasn't drunk at a restaurant or didn't try to make a pass at the waiter or waitress or whatever. So there's that one. And the third one is how does being like the shame by proxy stuff still affect your beliefs or reactions now? For example, um, you have to look perfect or if you're a bit OCD about having the house clean. Um, and having to grow up with chaotic parents. I think this is a big one too, is do you get triggered by your partner or boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever? If you're in a social gathering, are you triggered if they're a little bit like sort of gregarious? Are they embarrassing you? Does all that sort of shame or by proxy maybe belong to them? It's sort of, do you see how that mechanism maybe works there? So there's that. So that was shame by proxy. The third way is shame can manifest you simply by neglect. This is probably the most difficult one to kind of understand, so I'll do my best here. It's not direct shaming and it's not by proxy. It's by being a child left to the impossible tasks that you really couldn't make happen due to your age and that was sort of appropriate and right. In other words, that you were sort of set up by neglectful parents to just manage things on your own. That affects us way more than we think. Some examples, growing up in uh, a family that's like the ships in the night family and you're trying to get your parents to love each other, but you failed because it was impossible. Growing up with a depressed or substance abuse parent and trying to get them to be happy, but failing at that because it was impossible. Growing up with any, without any guidance about dating and guessing at things or failing at things or acting out, same thing, by neglect, you know, trying to make something happen on your own with no guidance or no safety. Um, growing up and unable to make basic things happen like field trips or science projects or homework or even being bullied, I know that that's like not a basic thing, um, and failing at those things because you got no help at all. Many childhood trauma survivors struggle with codependency and relationships because they are familiar with being the one trying to do the other person's emotional work just like childhood, to try to get that thing going there with that person, to try to get them to awaken, to try to get them to be a better person or wake up for you. That's what I mean about this neglect quality of shame. In the present, with this type of shame, we'll feel overly responsible and have poor self-esteem about making things happen. We'll also heavily blame ourselves for stuckness in career or having emotional stuckness. 
and we're responsible for the recovery of our childhood trauma, but not how we got here. So that's what a lot of these exercises are about. So to drive this one home about neglect, say, um, say that a 10 year old is left to take care, they're neglected, they're parentified, and they're left to take care of two smaller children. Imagine the overwhelm with not being able to get the baby to stop crying or changing diapers or the resentment at trying to entertain the six-year-old and then feeling terrible about ourselves for not being able to handle it or, or feeling ter terrible about ourselves for not wanting the job to begin with and not being able to handle it like an adult would, but like that's kind of what it was implied, like you take care of everything, we're gonna leave. Overwhelm, resentment, followed by shame for the resentment, overdoing or overcompensating and being totally selfless. That's what could be the result of being a parentophile child or the oldest taking care of the youngest when it's not our job. So that's what I mean with this one. We're unfairly set up to do what, what an adult could do and it, what only an adult could do, and it stays with us that we're feeling that we're not good or we're not good at things, we're not effective and we're not capable. Um, we'll find ourselves in romantic relationships with very difficult people and we'll think we're failing at making them happy is another way that that could play out. So that's shame by neglect. And the three homework pieces for that one, the three journaling topics are very similar to the last three is number one, reflect on how this shame by neglect came up, came up for you. Um, where you were neglected and that resulted in present focused shame. Um, what is the truth about those situations? Did your parents not want to be bothered? Were you set up to fail at impossible situations? Were you terrible at science fairs and projects? Um, is that the truth that you were terrible about those things? Or you were just, you had no healthy parent to guide you through those things? Um, did you get involved with trouble kids because you were a bad kid? or because nobody noticed that you were falling into the crowd with those kids. So that's what I mean by that. Number two is to write out, pick one of those big situations where you were shamed by neglect um, growing up and then rewrite it with how that would have gone down with a healthy parent, this is tricky. Healthy parents actually step in. They step into the bullying. They step in and get you a tutor. They step in and can kind of rectify if you've fallen in sort of like, I don't want to say the bad crowd, but like, you know what I mean? If they, if they, if they notice that you're acting out, they can sort of help out. Um, so that's what I mean about healthy parents. Number three is how does being neglected in childhood affect your shame beliefs in the present? For example, do you blame yourself, this is a big one, for not being like amazing all the time? Can't tell you how many trauma survivors, including myself, have that thing. If I'm not sort of a rocket scientist or a rock star on some level, then I'm awful. That can be a direct result of being neglected because we start to think that it is only through those amazing things that we will attain to be sort of seen or lovable or good enough. Um, do you crave attention but feel you don't deserve it, which could be another effect of being neglected in that way. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys. I would actually like to do a webinar in the future um, on this topic with more specific inner child sort of parenting dialogues and parenting techniques to shift out of toxic shame. And when I mean toxic, it is, it is a very deeply rooted thing. We're not gonna get out of that thing sort of overnight. And these exercises are about awareness, but you can't get out of it until you really be aware of where it, come, where it comes from. And I'd love to hear um, from you guys if you think a webinar like that would be helpful or what you thought about this video or ask questions. And I have an e-course on my website. It's called The Family Rules, as well as The Children's Bill of Rights, which are helpful at sort of excavating and unknowing about your family system more to get some ideas flowing about toxic shame and where it kind of comes from. For example, in The Family Rules, there's a toxic family rule, like it's your fault, things go wrong. And then you're supposed to come up with ideas about how that was true in childhood. And similar to this exercise, how it still runs you in the present and how it might come up in the present. So as always, guys, thank you so much for the time. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be joyous. Take care and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.